Hi, I'm the Dreaded Geek. Welcome back. This is the first request that I've had on my channel. We're going to do a review today of Romance of the Nine Empires. Romance of the Nine Empires is a fairly complicated game to explain. Not only in terms of the rule set, but also in terms of exactly what it is. It's a living card game that isn't. In fact, it's a fictional card game, but it isn't. Let me start at the beginning. There was a movie. The movie was about a gamer who got into a specific card game in order to win the affections of a girl gamer who played that game. She saw through him, he got good at the game and grew to love it anyway, then defended the game from a group that were trying to trying to break it apart and you'll have to watch the movie to get the rest of the rest or I'm gonna to get too spoilery. The game they played in the movie was fictional at the time. It was called Romance of the Nine Empires. It was very obviously an homage to the living card game uh, Legend of the Five Rings, uh, as well as the format of living card games in general. As part of the Kickstarter for making that movie, uh, AEG promised that if a certain point was hit in the funding, they would actually make the game. They did, and this is it. So, I've played through this game a few times, and as you can see, not enough times to have actually unpacked all the cards yet. The rule book very wisely suggests that you start with some of the simpler decks to play, and then progress one deck at a time until you've played through all of the complexity the game has to offer, and then you play with the spare cards that they supply you with in order to customize the decks a little bit. I have only played with the decks as they come so far, but I have looked through some of the extra cards in order to see what they add and what they could add to the strategies of the game. And I like the fact that this isn't a deck construction game, but they give you the ability to play with deck construction a little bit by giving you this extra pack and let you customize your deck to work just the way you want it to. Uh, it makes it feel that much more like a living card game. So, I need to get this out of the way. This, Arcane Fire, is the first expansion pack they released for the game. Uh, it contains um, at least most of it is is extra cards for customizing these decks. Um, I haven't played any games involving the cards from Roman, uh, from Arcane Fire yet, so I can't go too much into how good or bad the additions are. Um, but again, I've looked through the cards, looked through some of the cards anyway, and tried to see what I think it'll add to the game, and. For the most part, I like it. Like I said, I like the, f the f fact that AEG have given you that ability to play with this game as if it was a living card game, although they haven't actually made it a living card game. For those of you who keep hearing me say living card game and don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Romance of the Nine Empires mimics Legend of the Five Rings and more recently Game of Thrones, Star Trek, Star Wars, and a whole lot of other uh, games that have been released, um, Android Netrunner I think is the most recent of those, the base set is released and the base set is enough to build decks for a few players and to be able to play games in a couple of different styles. Then every, depending on the game, every month, every three months, every six months, a new pack is released that adds 
potentially a new faction to the game, but definitely new cards to use with new powers and new ways to customize what was given to you in the original set. And that is a living card game. The living part of the name comes from the fact that they usually have a storyline behind the world that is controlled by the way players play in uh, tournaments and what the general population playing the game seems to want from the game storyline. Obviously, Game of Thrones, the game follows the story of the books rather than a, a, a world that's defined by the players. Uh, but the concept is still there. Every time a new pack comes out, the storyline is progressed along the, the, the route the books took. So let's talk about how this plays. This deck is the Protectorate of Melchior. They're one of the most straightforward decks. Um, they're a, a straightforward attack deck. These would be the cards that I would start play, start with in play. The Protectorate of Melchior has a, a special ability described on the faction card, a Mott and Bailey, which represents the home castle of the faction, and then five structures down here that are able to generate, mostly generate um, gold for the, for the faction, but also store the supplies that are then used to feed troops and so on during the game. So here's some of the different types of cards that you may see during the game. Basically any card that you get into play has a cost um, in both supplies and in gold. Uh, in order to play it. There are action cards such as these that are played immediately for a specific a specific purpose. Move your target hero with at least three will from the current battle to an unresolved battle at another castle. Um, engage your target unbowed opposed hero. Discard a card. Increase the damage by the card's fate value. If you discard this card to absorb damage, draw two cards. And so on and so forth. Uh, these cards are, to use the terms that most of us are, are common with, are familiar with, instants. They're played right now for a specific purpose and they're done. Um, these are the faction heroes, these characters I would play in front of me and would then be able to send to battle, would be able sometimes to use uh, for specific abilities, and I'm looking around to see if there are any heroes in front of me that have special abilities. The general here increases my maximum hand size by two. Uh, this one has limits on which characters can uh, take his damage in, in combat. Um, and some of them have instant-like abilities as well. Um, that that just inc increase your flexibility during general gameplay. The primary con uh, purpose for putting down characters is to be able, for this deck anyway, is to be able to attack with them in order to, de to destroy the su um, supplies on my enemy's buildings and then destroy the buildings themselves. Once the enemy has none of these left, they're eliminated from the game. 
which in a two player game makes me the winner. Um, I can attach cohorts, I think is the, the word they use, um, extra units that deploy with this unit. Um, I can attach them to, to a character. Um, these are unaligned characters that you can play. They're, they're not from my faction specifically. They could be in any deck. Um, and then these cards that represent... I want to say places because that's the way they're described in the rules, but as one of the examples I've put down is exotic mounts, uh, places seems a little inaccurate. Uh, but they represent, in general, places that I control and that give me special abilities. Um, the Corrupted Mine and the Salt Mine both um, both generate extra gold for me. Um, exotic Mounts generates extra gold. I can sacrifice mounts to move heroes into battle um, outside of the normal phase of action. There's nothing all that unusual about the cards themselves and what they do. Um, anybody who's played Legend of the Five Rings or Magic or even Pokemon and other similar games is going to recognize most of what I just described as fairly standard bringing my creatures, heroes, characters, warriors, call them what you will, um, into play, attaching items or um, cohorts, allies, call them what you will, to them, and putting them in battle against my opponent. The interesting part to me for this game comes in how the turn is structured. The turn's divided into the spring phase, which is the reset phase that we're all used to from card games. Uh, you straighten your cards, to, uh, you move them from a turned position to an upright position, which signifies that they're available to do their actions again. The summer phase is where most of the action happens. Um, you can perform the abilities that are on cards, most of which are listed as happening during the summer phase. You can bring um, cards into play during this phase, uh, and you can start battles during this turn, during this phase of the turn. Uh, battles are a whole nother thing, which I will go into in a little bit. During the autumn phase, there are some other abilities that can be used only during autumn, um, and then there's raiding. Raiding is a, a smaller version of battle with the specific goal of removing supplies from your enemy's castles. And then during winter, you use your food tokens that are on um, your castles well, those who don't have any food tokens left on their castles are eliminated from the game, um, and you do all hand maintenance operations during the winter phase at the end of the game, drawing back to your hand size, uh, removing cards that, that have been destroyed or that the goals haven't been met to keep them on the table, um, and so on and so forth. During battle, there is a, a long drawn out process of applying one of your heroes against uh, applying one of your heroes into into the battle having your opponent do whatever is necessary to um, soak that damage without taking any any permanent damage to their castles um, or to their supplies and you go through this backwards and forwards until both you and the attacker are, are out of actions um, there's more to it than that but if I was to describe it in full, we would be here all day. The rules are 20 pages long. Um, that's the short version of, of what battle is. Um, every character that's been put into the battle is used. Every action that you have available to you to use in battle is used. And you go through all of that in order to, to define the, the outcome of that battle. Battles can result in um, destroying your opponent's castles, which is one of the win conditions of the game, as I mentioned earlier, or of destroying their uh, supply tokens, which is the other, um, the other, well, one of the other potential victory conditions of the game. Again, one of the nice things about this is 
like I said, it, it was obviously not based on, but it's an homage to things like Legend of the Five Rings. Even the, the name of the game is, is you know, structured to, to hint at Legend of the Five Rings. And true to that game, um, beating up on your opponents is not the only way to win the game. Um, there is a renowned victory, um, which one of the decks in, in the starter pack is constructed specifically to win uh, by a renowned victory, um, which you achieve by going on and completing great quests for the country, uh, for the for the land. Um, I'm just going to look in here for the other victory conditions. And there I don't see it. It's got to be in here somewhere. So of the of the five decks that are present in the in the initial box the one that I showed, Melchior, is a standard military deck. The Ord is another fairly standard military deck. Um, the Displaced is a deck that is more defensive, and although they're willing to go to war as well, um, they win by staying back, defending their home, and then raiding their opponents to get more food in order to put more tokens, uh, to put more heroes down in order to be more defensive. Um, the Ixasa, Ixasa, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that, deck is a, a called a control deck. Um, they will steal their opponent's food so that their opponent can't afford to play anything new onto the, onto the table and gain strength that way. Um, and the Holden deck, which is the most complicated of the starter decks, is the questing deck. This is the one that wins by renown. Um, you play a quest onto the table, the quest has certain uh, conditions that you have to meet in order to complete the quest, and once you complete the quest you gain some renown, um, and once you reach a certain renown total that I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, 20 I think, well I could be confusing that with L5R, um, once you have 20 renown um, you win the game regardless of the current military status of the game. Um, basically, you're too famous and loved by the people for anybody to want to attack you anymore anyway. Um, I like the variety that comes with the different ways of winning the game. Uh, however, the balance of the game is very strongly towards the combat decks. The fact that you have to use your hit points, essentially, your food, um, in order to summon things, and then when you get attacked you lose them, and then if you get raided you lose some more. Um, to me just makes military too strong. Um, if I can defend my castles, I don't just have a stronger military, I have the ability to have a stronger military because I have more food uh, hanging around because of that. Um, I, I think the military decks are too strong. However, this seems to have been a great challenge to the gaming community. Nobody has really stood up and said, Holden sucks as a faction, I can't play them, uh, they're, they're just awful. Everybody has stood up and said, how do I win with Holden? Let me see if I can make a winning deck that wins that way. And that's one of the things I like about living card games. Uh, in a true living card game, as opposed to this, that was just the main deck and so far just the one expansion, there's been no sign of a second, that's all there is. But in a true living card game, when people are saying, how do I win with Holden, I can't seem to build, win it build a winning strategy with a Holden deck, that's a sign for the manufacturer, the dist distributor of the game, to start putting some more power into the Holden cards, to start tweaking the mechanics of the game in such a way that that, that mechanic has a e slightly easier time to make it more competitive. Um, and, and that's what I love about living card games. This, as an homage to living card games, doesn't represent a great outlay of capital. You don't have to buy a new expansion every month or two. Um, it's just these two packs and you're done for good. Um, 
and it has a lot of that same gameplay that living card games bring um, unfortunately it means that there's nobody to respond to questions like how do i win with a holden deck um, but i think the answers are all here already i think there are enough cards in this extra pack of cards that are here just for just for customizations and in the expansion um, there are enough cards there to give anybody the what they need to build a winning deck in whatever strategy they want to follow and that has been a review of romance of the nine empires and i am the dreaded geek thanks for watching